Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. Brought to you by public television stations. By Hanson Trust, a $10 billion transatlantic company with 23 consecutive years of growth in earnings and dividends by providing essential goods and services. By Prudential Beach Securities, the investment firm with rock-solid resources that's leading the way to the future for investors. And by Primerica, the new name in financial services and specialty retailing, a company with the resources to fund growth for tomorrow, Primerica, a name to remember. Produced Friday, October 16. Our panelists are Mary Farrell, Lewis Holland, and Martin Zweig. Tonight's special guest is Alan Sinai, Chief Economist and Managing Director, Shearson Lehman Brothers. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. The stock market, we are told, is always delivering a message. The only trick is knowing how to read it. Well, this week, no great cleverness was required to catch the message coming from the stock market. That message was, help! <laughs> Last week, the Dow Jones Industrials had recorded their largest point loss in history, down nearly 159 points for the week. At the time, it seemed extremely unpleasant. In retrospect, though, it is beginning to look like a joyride. For this week, the Dow crashed more than 235 points and set a bundle of other nasty all-time records in the process. Just as a sampler to help make your weekend merry, consider these nuggets. A week ago Tuesday, the Dow took its worst one-day point hit ever, more than 91 points. It managed to beat that twice this week, climaxing today with a 108-point mauling that occurred in the heaviest day of trading in the two centuries of the New York Stock Exchange. 338 million shares. Want more? How about this? All the broader market indexes also had record point declines today. The week's trading on the big board was itself a record. And as for that long-deferred correction, the Dow had not had so much as a 10% sell-off in more than three years, the index was off nearly that much this week alone and has now fallen 17.5% since its peak less than two months ago. Is it any wonder that a study this week reported that Americans' favorite color is blue? They must have done most of their polling in brokerage offices. But before we all turn the color of Smurfs, let's stop and consider what caused all this and where we go from here. First, let's round up the usual suspects. Interest rates are moving up, a development that hits stocks with a double whammy. Higher rates cut into corporate profits and deter expansion. In addition, they increase the attractiveness of investments that compete with stocks. With Treasury bonds tumbling another two points this week, to their lowest levels in two years, the yields on all fixed income investments are on the rise. Second, jitters over new incidents in the Persian Gulf gave already nervous traders a fresh excuse to keep on selling. Third, the political situation was scarcely encouraging. Not only the concern over leadership in both parties, but a new tax increase package in the House Ways and Means Committee that would further penalize investment and savings. Nice going, guys. Fourth, Wall Street itself seemed in disarray. From scary layoffs at two major firms to growing evidence that the mindless, computer-driven program trading of the big institutions can turn worry into panic and prudent selling into wholesale desertion. Should we then act as hysterically as the computers? Or is this one of those many times in recent years when a little perspective and a little perseverance 
will eventually put the wise individual well ahead of the crowd. That's what we'll be investigating tonight with my panel and with one of the most respected economists in Wall Street. First, though, before we bring in first aid, let's count the wounded this past week in Wall Street. The Dow Jones Industrial Average made it 394 points down in two weeks. Taking flight early on when the trade deficit failed to narrow as much as expected, and then thoroughly ignoring, among other things, attempted reassurances about the economy from Treasury Secretary James Baker and Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan. The week's loss of more than 235 points to 2246.73 took the Dow below 2400, not to mention 2300, for the first time since June. The index hasn't been this low since May 22nd. And just take a look at these losses in the broader market indexes. Even our elves grew more despondent, taking their technical market index down two notches to a still neutral minus one. Do I have any consolation for you? Well, don't forget how high these averages are. Today's record point loss, for example, was on a percentage basis only number 76 on the all-time list of bad days for the Dow. Precious metals picked up a bit for the week, close to 10 bucks for gold and six cents for silver, but there was no great euphoria there either. Tonight, many commentators have been saying to quote one on-air analyst, that the bull is dead. Marty Zweig is one who has been correctly worried about this market lately. Do you agree with that comment? Yes. Um, but I haven't been looking for a bear market, per se. I've been really, in my own mind, looking for a crash. But I didn't want to talk about it publicly because it's like shouting fire in a crowded theater. And there's other ways to play it. You just tilt your strategy negatively and you shut your mouth. And I think we're in the middle of something reminiscent of 1946 or 1962, which were very similar, and to some extent 29, but it won't be as bad. And I think we're in the, oh, the middle to somewhat beyond the middle of this break. And uh, there'll be some violent rallies, though. In fact, probably early next week, I expect a violent rally. But that would not change your long-term estimate that the bull market's over? Well, I, I don't look for a long bear market here. I only look for a brief decline, but a vicious one. In 1962, the damage was done in two months. In 1929, it was done in, oh, mostly uh, 10 weeks. And I don't think it's going to drag on any longer than that here, but it just will go down more and then turn around. Some people say it's a bear market if you're off as much as 20 percent. We're nearly there now. What oh, you, yeah. What's your definition of it? Well, bear it would market? be a bear market, but I think of a bear market 1973, 74, where it's drawn out for quite a while, whereas a crash is something like 46 or 62 that's over in, say, a month or two. Uh, that's, to me, the difference. How should people play it? Very cautiously. Um, I, you're going to be hurt no matter whether you're bullish or bearish. There's too many traps to fall into. We should have a selling climax and probably two of them. And after a selling climax, they always go back lower. So we're probably going to have, I'd say, three gigantic rallies within the next month or so, and, and every one of them could be a trap. Except the last one, <laughs> of course. But whenever that comes, you don't know. It's hard. Mary Farrell, Marty, in his affable way, has used that nasty word, crash. Do you accept that estimate? No. And I wouldn't accept the estimate that the bull market is over either. Certainly we're in a correction, and that's been more than obvious. And I think you have to remember here that we're not dealing with real buyers and real sellers making real buy and sell decisions like in the old stock market, because you do have this computerized program trading and this portfolio insurance really making these very extreme, very rapid decisions. May I ask you a question about that? Yes. These computers are used by large institutional investors whose money managers are paid huge sums of money to make no-brain decisions that are made for them by computers. Aren't these guys overpaid? <laughs> I don't think I want to answer yes. that one. I Luke. think you just did. <laughs> Tell us why you don't think the bull market's over. Well, I think interest rates are the real key here. At these levels, we'd have to see some interest rate relief to see the bull market continue into a, another leg. And I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. We could see some rate declines by next year, and that would certainly be a positive. At these levels, though, I would agree with Marty, we're in for some rough sledding. And, and the risk here really is that interest rates don't give you that relief, and then you would, you would continue with more of the same. Lou Holland, we have one extreme negative, one reassurance. How do you we have one extreme negative, one reassurance. How do you vote? Well, I'm more positive, I think, than uh, either uh, Marty or Mary, in that I think that we've probably had 90% of the decline 
Uh, I think it's possible we could go lower here over the next uh, week or so. Uh, but I think sometime between now and the, maybe the end of the year or the end of the first quarter that you'll see the market uh, in excess of its recent highs. What do you base that on? Why, why do you disagree well, with Well, I would agree with Mary in that I think we're due for a, a rally in the bond market. Uh, and I think we will see some improvement in, improvement in terms of the trade numbers as we go forward here. And corporate earnings, I think, are going to get better as we go forward also. So I think that interest rates probably are the key. Uh, to the extent that uh, through the first half of the year, or really through the first nine months of the year up until recently, the bond market and the stock market had moved in an inverse relationship. Uh, now I think you will see somewhat more coupling of the two, and I think that interest rates probably will rally sometime over the next several months, and I think we'll enjoy a nice uh, recovery when that occurs. Let's hope we're all still solvent when that occurs. In any event, panelists, it is time now to rush aid to the wounded and answer some questions from our viewers. Marty Zweig, Harold Roth of Beloit, Wisconsin, is curious about the huge volume of trading on Wall Street this year, as dramatized by today's record. He wonders if there are precise statistics available about the number of people who are participating as compared with the number of institutions and how much of the trading each group represents. In short, what is the impact of us little guys and do we still have a chance? Well, there's, say, 20 to 30 million of little guys, but a lot of them aren't that active. There's thousands of institutions, but the institutions do roughly 43% of the share volume on the exchange, and the public does about 30%, and members do the rest. In dollar numbers, though, the institutions would have about a two-to-one lead because the public tends to buy lower-priced stocks. On the Amex, the public does more than double what the institutions do, uh, but the institutions have more impact now than the public uh, overall. All righty, Mary Farrell, Charles Collins of Shreveport, Louisiana, like a lot of other people tonight, is a self-confessed nervous Nelly in what he calls this gyrating market. He's begun to worry even about the possible effect of a crash on his money market mutual funds. How safe are they? How vulnerable is he to a possible catastrophe? Generally speaking, money market mutual funds are a very safe place to be, and I'm sure there's a lot of people on Wall Street wish they had a little more money in them after a day like today or a week like this week. They're safe for two reasons. One is they have a short maturity, very short term, usually on average about 45 days. And secondly, they're very high quality. Some invest solely in government securities. Usually it's AAA or at least AA rated. But his, one, his real safety factor is to read the prospectus, to be assured on both them where they will clearly state the maturity and credit limitations. And generally speaking, even a collapse of the stock market should have no effect on the money market funds. All righty. Lou Holland, how would you respond to Sidney Bauer of Seguin, Texas, who writes as follows. There's every, every, every indication that in 1988, regular gasoline containing lead will probably become an obsolete commodity. Many older trucks and cars, plus much industrial and farm equipment, still require regular leaded gasoline or engine damage will result. Can you suggest stock investments that might be good for someone wanting to profit from the additives that will be sold to compensate for the absence of lead and fuels for use in these engines? Well, Mr. Bauer, you're quite right. In 1988, it will be more difficult to find leaded gasoline. However, I think you should uh, consider investments in area that ha areas that have some growth potential. And to the extent that most vehicles now really are adaptable to unleaded gasoline, uh, it's not a very large market. But I guess there is one company, Lubrizoil, that does have an additive uh, or an octane enhancer, I would say, that might be something that you could play. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if you would like to get the lead out of your investments, it would be a gas if you'd give me a chance to pump our panelists. So send us your highest octane money questions here at Wall Street Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's Wall Street Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. And step on it. Now, before we meet tonight's special guest, let's take a look at an area that lately has become to him and many other experts a matter of interest and concern. For starters, let's follow the trail of short-term yields, as tracked here by those on 90-day U.S. Treasury bills since January 1985. After topping out above 8.5% in March of that year, T-bill yields went on a pretty steady decline, dipping to a low of 5.18% one year ago this month. Then the trend went back on the rise, with T-bill yields today at 6.8%. Meanwhile, municipal bonds, with their inviting federally tax-free returns, have lost some of their investor appeal with the recent changes in the tax laws. 
Muni's peaked in March 85 above 9 and 3 quarters percent, then dropped as low as 6.6 percent in January and February of this year, before climbing back to today's 9.45 percent yield. Yields on long-term U.S. government bonds, following the pattern of the T-bills and munis, reached their recent high in March 85 at more than 11 and 3 quarters percent. The rates dropped consistently after that, hitting a low of 7.6 percent last January. But T-bond yields today are all the way back to 10.17 percent. Is all the good news about lower interest rates now behind us? And what does that mean for the economy and the financial markets? For some thoughts on that, let's go over now and meet tonight's special guest, Alan Sinai. Alan, welcome. Hello, Please. Alan Sinai's financial forecast spanned the globe and delve into just about every nook and cranny on Wall Street. He spent a dozen years at Data Resources, co-developing its renowned models of the U.S. economy with the late Otto Eckstein, an old friend of this program. In 1983, Dr. Sinai joined Shearson Lehman Brothers, where he is currently the chief economist and a managing director. Alan, what sort of signals does a week like this past one send to your forecasts? They're very serious. Uh, the uh, signs and the symptoms that the financial markets are giving off are of a very uh, bad problem for our markets and our economy and uh, have to make me much more worried about the economy for next year. Have you changed your economic forecast as a result of this week's action? Well, you know, uh, the uh, extraordinary levels of interest rates, even at these rates of inflation and the uh, tremendous decline in the stock market, are symptoms of both uh, huge budget and trade deficits, tremendous amount of financing, and no one can say for sure how high interest rates have to go in order for that to occur. And uh, the result of this much problem on interest rates, three percentage points higher this year, and of the big declines in the stock market, have to be much more damage to... Uh, our economy and uh, raise the risks of a recession next year. Give us a forecast for each of those three interest rates we just saw. What do you expect to happen to T-bills, munis, T-bonds? Well, over the next two or three weeks... Uh, well, over the next year. Over the next year, on average, uh, they should move higher. Uh, we are later in the stage of the business expansion, and uh, we should see uh, long bonds, uh, and, and there will be respites, there will be some periods of improvement, but uh, between now and then, uh, another point, point and a half on uh, long-term interest rates with uh, much higher short-term rates in the interim. You uh, quite recently said you didn't expect a recession next year, and now you're raising that specter. At what, what point next year and what odds do you get it? Well, up to now, uh, at least until April of this year, I thought the odds were 1 in 10 of a recession before the end of 1988. Starting in April, I thought those odds were 1 in 4. And now I'd have to say that uh, there's a 1 in 3 chance the odds are still good that we'll get through it, get through 88 into 89, but uh, the risks are growing uh, almost by the day. And 89 looks more risky, even than 88. What could we do to avoid the forecast you've just made coming true? Well, at a certain stage in the business expansion, there's only one forecast in interest rates. On average, they have to move higher regularly. Uh, as inflation moves higher, and as the business cycle moves to, uh, business expansion moves to an end. And the only way to avoid that is through a major slowdown or a uh, recession. Uh, it is uh, the only other way is for inflation rates to go a lot lower than 4 to 5 percent, back to 3 to 4 percent. Another possibility would be a breakthrough in the budget deficit more than Washington has done on the Graham Redmond Hollings fix, a uh, substantial improvement in the trade deficit, much weaker economies overseas, or, uh, or interest rate relief from overseas. If you run through each of those, Right now, uh, none of them look very uh, uh, probable. What does that suggest for investors? Well, what does that suggest for investors? Well, we are winding down uh, this expansion, and uh, the financial problems and troubles that we see now are part and parcel of every business expansion as we get to the end. Uh, what most people don't realize is that all this financial trouble does get back into the real economy, which looks very healthy at this time, and with lags, that brings the economy down. So I think investors have no choice but to be very cautious, uh, very cautious in terms of um, uh, fixed income and uh, equity investments, uh, to be more uh, in cash, and uh, to look and hope for some relief uh, uh, out of Washington, or relief in the form of 
a slowdown in the economy without it recessing, or relief on the inflation front. I don't know why they call it the dismal science. Let's let you talk to our sunshine boy, starting with Marty Zweig. Alan, uh, of course, interest rates have been up here in the United States this year. They've also gone up in Japan and Germany. Yeah. Uh, would this have any effect on our dollar? Hmm. Or will it have Well, the dollar is, the dollar? Uh, is uh, getting help from the higher interest rates. But because the dollar stays higher, our trade deficit doesn't get help. And we're stuck. Trade deficit doesn't get better. We still f have a lot of financing overseas to do, right. and that tends to push interest rates up. Those deficits and the financing of them, I think, are really what are keeping interest rates so high relative to inflation. It's a mistake to think that inflation is the key to interest rates. It's those deficits. Okay. Well, interest rates seem to be on everyone's minds. So a related question. With the real interest rate on the bonds at the high level that it is on a historical basis right now, would you expect the bond market to show better performance in the coming months than it has to date? Well, we will surely have some relief uh, in the uh, bond market. Uh, I think the next two or three weeks could be more of a problem because there is a major Treasury refunding the first week of November. It's a little hard to see who will stand up and buy long bonds as we move into and through that uh, refunding not knowing where interest rates have to go to pay our, our lenders off, uh, a lot of that foreign investors. Beyond that, the bond market should do better. Uh, and we may see two or three months of uh, a good bond market. But I think on average, uh, unless those other factors I mentioned come about, interest mm -hmm. rates are headed up. Mm -hmm. Alan, to the extent that the Japanese and the Germans don't uh, seem to be stimulating their economies, I am that interest rates are going up, as Marty indicated before. Do you think there's a chance that, uh, that we will not support the dollar as aggressively as we have in the past, meaning not push our interest rates up? There's been some discussion recently in the press uh, with regard to that. I'd like to know what your views are. Well, I think the, uh, we will not uh, continue to support the dollar through higher interest rates as the initial stage of response to more downward pressure on the dollar, especially since they are raising their interest rates. The Federal Reserve is caught. If they raise interest rates, they are risking the expansion. And so of the choices, it is better to let the dollar go down. I would expect the countries together to try to manage orderly declines in the dollar by successively lowering the trading range for the dollar step by step as the dollar comes under more pressure at specific times. Alan, all the very real problems you have just cited were in existence two weeks ago. The Dow was 400 points higher. Why did it choose this moment to fall? I think the uh, problem I allude to has existed since May 1986, and first in the fixed income markets when we began to worry about foreign participation and how much we would have to pay to borrow from overseas. Uh, but when interest rates reach these levels, then every notch up is a problem for stocks because they are a problem for the pace of the economy, corporate profits, and now the risks of recession in 1988 and the risk, greater risk of recession in 1989 is within the sights of equity market investors uh, much more so than they were two weeks ago, four weeks ago, Alan? two months ago. Yeah. Alan Greenspan said this week the economy was in better shape than people thought. Inflation was not the threat people believed. Jim Baker said this week interest rates are coming down. The trade people emphasize that for three quarters now in unit sales, the deficit has been shrinking. Are they all just whistling in the dark? That is, uh, virtually all of that is an accurate representation of the facts as they exist. But we all know that financial markets look ahead. And I think perhaps they're missing that point. Uh, Do you not think corporate profits will be up next year? They'll be up, but not nearly at the rate this year. This year, 22, 25 percent. Next year, 10 to 15 percent. And even that 10 to 15 percent is beginning to fade as a possibility. Are you at all concerned about the massive declines caused by computer program trading in these markets? Well, yes, because we have huge swings in the market. But as a matter of philosophy, no, this is a device uh, for securities trading. And I think investors just need to recognize that the moves are magnified by it. But I wouldn't uh, think that they should be uh, changed, outlawed, uh, ruled out, or anything like that. They are a factor which tends to magnify any changes in fundamentals that occur. You've uh, expressed severe criticism of where we are economically in terms of policy. Are any of the presidential candidates talking more sense in your view? It's too early. But I don't think uh, any of them are really uh, facing up to uh, 
uh, the problems of the deficits uh, in a way that looks uh, promising at this time. What should be done about the deficits? Well, wh what I would say is, is, is going to be, in theory, correct, I think, but in practice, hardly possible. But we are now at the stage where we need some sort of magical uh, feat in which we cut the budget deficits very substantially, at the same time enlist the aid of the Federal Reserve to offset that restraint through easier monetary policy and lower interest rates. And on top of that, we have to get our trading partners into it to stimulate their economies with lower interest rates at the same time. Is the answer to, to uh, get tough with our trading partners, as people suggest? Oh, I think some of that uh, will be tried. Will it be successful? Part of our problem today is a crisis in confidence because in Washington we're having trouble and we're having trouble dealing with our trading partners. Well, I have to thank you, Alan, Alan Sinai. Thank, thanks for making our spirits even a little bit lower than they were half an hour ago. Thanks, too, to our panel. One or two of you may be right. Who knows? And I hope you'll all be back with us again next week when we'll see what's cooking with the food stocks. My guest, June Page, is a leading analyst of the Bettable Edibles, and she'll be sharing her best financial recipes with you and me. So join us for a five-star evening, and let's hope by then we'll all have more money to pay the bill. Meanwhile, this has been Wall Street Week. I'm Louis Rukeyser. Good night. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser has been brought to you by public television stations, by Hanson Trust, a $10 billion transatlantic company with 23 consecutive years of growth in earnings and dividends by providing essential goods and services, by Prudential Beach Securities, the investment firm with rock-solid resources that's leading the way to the future for investors, and by Primerica, the new name in financial services and specialty retailing, a company with the resources to fund growth for tomorrow, Primerica, a name to remember. Stay tuned for Upstairs, Downstairs, next here on Channel 17, TV worth watching. For a printed transcript of this program, send $3 to transcripts. Wall Street Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's $3 to transcripts. Wall Street Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Maryland residents, please add 15 cents sales tax. Wall Street Week transcripts are also available to subscribers of the Dow Jones News Retrieval Service. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser is produced by Maryland Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Next time, nature turns... American painters such as Child, Hassam, George Innes, and Robert Henry were held. As it turned out, Cornelia Sage had a flair for the theatric as well as the artistic. And important talents from the performing arts soon found their way to the gallery.